So we're in the middle of our look at the institutions of government. And in the last series of mini lectures, we were taking a look at Congress. And we wanted to understand kind of the way Congress works. And we then combined that with looking at uh, some of the readings in Congress. Now, what we're going to be moving into now is the presidency. The presidency. Uh, the presidency, and this is this is actually one of my specializations. This is one of the things that I research and uh, write in myself, um, specifically presidency and new media work. If you're if you're interested in that, uh, what's particularly unique about the presidency is is we all kind of understand. Congress, at least in a basic sense, right? You have Congress persons, and they're elected somehow. You probably didn't know everything you knew about constituencies and the and the rules and procedures of Congress. But what about the presidency? If I if I ask you to picture the presidency, what pops into your mind? And my guess is that for many of you, probably one of two things pop into your mind. One possibility is an individual person pops into your mind, so a president that you particularly like, so maybe. Bush or Clinton or Obama pops into your mind, um, or maybe like the building or the structure that is the house uh, for the president per se uh, pops into your mind. And, and both of these are valid because the presidency is kind of this two simultaneous things. Presidents are simultaneously a person and an institution, right? So there is a person who is the president. But the president has num tons and tons of bureaucracy that works for him, that makes the presidency what it is, and that's the institution, it's the office. And the two things go together. As a matter of fact, you can't easily separate one from the other. So one of the things that we're going to have to do is try to understand the presidency both as a person and understand the presidency as an institution. Now, the other thing, and we talked about this with Congress as well, is we want to understand the trajectory, right? We want to understand where the president was as an institution and how it's changed over time to now. And we mentioned in the Congress section that Congress was originally, and probably by design, to be the first branch, meaning to be the thing that was the most important because it was the lawmaking function. But we said today the president ends up ha actually having this role. And I used to even make bets with students and I'd say, look, go out and find me a, a current edition textbook that has Congress in the title. So a current edition American government textbook that has Congress in the title, and, and you can't do it. Um, there isn't any. It was always funny because people would think, oh, they're going to win the bet, uh, but they never would. Um, but you can find some introductory textbooks for got classes just like this uh, that refer to the president. And that's indicative of a trend over time. Uh, as a matter of fact, Woodrow Wilson, who would be a political scientist and a president, would name his first textbook Congressional Government. And that was the textbook for his introductory textbook for American government. Um, so obviously the presidency has shifted through time. And we want to take a look briefly at some of these changes. And the easiest way is let's take a look at George Washington and George W. Bush. Now here, not too long, we'll have to shift, but we're looking at Bush because Bush is the last finished president, right? So Obama still has a couple of years left to go. Um, the presidency is radically different today than it was in, at, at its conception. So, for instance, Washington presided over a government of only a handful of federal employees, and even as late as 1801, there's only about 300 total federal, federal office holders in the whole capital. So, not much going on here. By contrast, George W. Bush would preside over a huge budget and employee base. So if we compare just budgets to start with, and these are in constant dollars. 
And that's a way of being able to compare a dollar today uh, to a number amount in the past, right? Because you have inflation, right? So you have some kind of way of holding it, even for this. And one way to do it is constant dollars. Uh, George Washington has about a $4 million budget. And to put that into, into uh, comparison, that's about the size of the budget uh, for our support center here at DSC, <laughs> right? George W. Bush will have a budget of approximately $1.8 trillion. Uh, George Washington and that very first institution staff will have a cabinet of five people. Five people. <laughs> Um, and a few secretaries for those, uh, mainly for Hamilton. George W. Bush will have a bureaucracy of 2.4 million civilians. Now, we say civilians here because we aren't sure the total number of military officials uh, that could be involved. As a matter of fact, you go to the Pentagon and they have floors under which you know they have no information about. Well, I can tell you they're there, but I can't tell you what goes on in them. Um, <clears throat> So we just don't know about that. Um, so, you know, keeping it just to uh, civilians, 2.4 million. That's a huge number. So obviously the shift from Washington uh, to Bush has been a sizable one. And <clears throat> what we can kind of see, one of the stories of that trajectory of presidential power is, is that presidents have slowly gathered power for themselves and their uh, predecessors. As a matter of fact, here's a quote from President George W. Bush. He says, I am mindful not only of preserving executive powers for myself, but for my predecessors as well. And he's not alone in this. Every president is thinking about his place in this line of presidents. Um, and the presidency has an odd birth. Right? It's the country's first constitution. As we know, the Articles of Confederation didn't have what? It didn't have an executive branch. Because executive power had been equated with the tyranny of Britain's George, King George III. But then we saw that during and after the Revolutionary War, many begin to see the lack of an executive as a fundamental flaw. And Washington will set up a precedent of pushing uh, executive powers, uh, at least a bit. So that today, there's a number of bases of power and things that we need to understand about um, the president. One is the president is not overly democratic, and this is actually a power source. And what we mean by this is, is you don't uh, directly elect presidents. And we're going to learn about the Electoral College in more detail here. We we'd hinted at it earlier in the semester, but we're going to cover it now. Um, presidents are not necessarily beholden to larger states, meaning just because you're Texas doesn't mean you get to decide what's going to happen with the president, or just because you're California, for that matter, doesn't mean you're going to decide what happens to the president. Um, and then the president has become a major check and is checked by other branches of government. As a matter of fact, this is probably the most important uh, political dynamic that we're going to be looking at. We've already kind of talked about this in terms of Congress. So Congress checks presidential power, or at least sometimes does, and presidents attempt to check congressional power. Uh, and presidents are going to have a lot of power surrounding military and foreign affairs issues. As a matter of fact, one of the reasons that you consistently uh, see presidents cast everything in terms of war, war on poverty, war on drugs, war on whatever, is because that's where they have the bulk of their power. So let's chat just a little bit about the qualifications and the method for becoming president, and then we're going to be done, but that's a big deal. There are three major qualifications for the presidency, uh, age, residency, and citizenship. And this comes from Article 2, Section 1 of the
the Constitution, and I'll just read the section real fast. It says, quote, No per person except a natural-born citizen or a citizen of the United States at the time of the adoption of this Constitution shall be eligible to the office of the President. Neither shall any person be eligible to that office who shall not have attained the age of 35 years and been 14 years a resident within the United States. What this pragmatically means is that, one, you have to be 35 years old to run, although presidents are generally much older than this. Um, the residency is you have to have been living in the United States for 14 years, so we don't want somebody, theoretically, who has been uh, outside the country, living there permanently, and then coming back with kind of uh, foreign influence and running the country, per se. Um, and finally, citizenship, you have to be natural born. That means that you cannot have been born outside of the country unless you were born to American presidents. So there's this kind of issue called just soil. Um, and uh, <laughs> I'm blanking on that part. But in other words, you have to be an actual American citizen at that juncture. Um, no one who immigrates can be a president. Now, how do we then pick our presidents? Because you're probably used to thinking, oh, well, I vote for them, right? Well, sort of. Instead of actually voting directly for the president, we actually use what's called, and I've talked about earlier, the Electoral College. The Electoral College is a method to uh, make the presidency less democratic. And as a matter of fact, this is going to be one of the biggest issues at the Constitutional Convention. They're going to take it up. They're going to first raise this question of how should we vote for presidents in the first week of their session on May 29th, 1787. But it's not going to actually get settled until September uh, or about 11 days before the end of the convention. That's how contentious um, this is. And so the Virginia plan, as we talked about, was interested in, in where Congress selects a president. We chatted about that already. Um, and others, like James Wilson, were interested in a direct popular vote. And the solution to this was the, collect the Electoral College. And it is the most unique, Ameri it's a unique American device. No other country has anything quite like this, for good or for ill, as you might see. Um, and it works this way. The original method said that each state will get a number of electoral college votes equal to the number of House members they have, plus two. And each of these individuals, who will be selected by the state, will get to cast two votes for president. So far, so good. Now, what happens then is, is the guy in first place becomes president. And the guy in second, or the runner-up, becomes the vice president. That means in the last electoral cycle, President Obama would still have been president. However, uh, Mitt Romney would have been his vice president. All right, now think about that for a second. Because <laughs> the idea was, okay, well, you know, the second most popular guy, surely he should be the vice president. Um... And this is all fine and dandy until the election of 1800. So let's kind of go through this process, right? So, original method. Electoral college is equal to the number of U.S. representatives plus two. And state legislatures determine who will be these individuals. Now, slowly over time, what happened was is that state legislatures uh, created votes to determine who these people were, popular votes. And that's what happens today. So when you vote for president, you're actually voting for members of the Electoral College. You still are. <clears throat> so, when you vote in Florida, for instance, you are assigning one of our 29 Electoral College votes. Now, Here's what happens in the election of 1800, and this is going to be the only change to the selection process. 
in the election of 1800, we're going to have John Adams running against Thomas Jefferson and their vice presidential candidates, or Pickney and Burr, respectively. Now, George Washington, before Adams, would win unanimously twice. John Adams, as you might know, ends up becoming the second president of the United States in the third election. But unfortunately for Adams, it was his political opponent, Thomas Jefferson, who would become his vice president, resulting in, as you might imagine, some very strained personal relationships. So, when Adams runs for re-election in 1800, um, he will run against Jefferson, and Jefferson will pick Aaron Burr to be his vice president. Now, here's what ends up happening. Um, Adams and Pickney loses. Okay, so far so good. However, the problem is, is that Jefferson and Burr will actually tie with 73 uh, electoral votes each, right? Because everybody who was voting for them just casted one of their votes for Jefferson and one of their votes for Burr, but there's no distinction between president and vice president. So Jefferson and Burr end up tying for the presidency. Oops. This is kind of a big deal. So, <clears throat> what happens is that in the case of a tie in the United States, and this is still the case, the House of Representatives is designed to break that tie. And they vote in a very unique way. They vote by state. So that means each state, all the representatives have to come together and agree how they're going to vote. Well, the, uh, the House is very, very divided. And they actually end up voting again and again and again and again and again and again. And they vote 36 times before finally one of the members ends up abstaining, which allows Thomas Jefferson to become the third president of the United States. And because of all the drama of this, we get one of the fastest constitutional amendments in history, and that is the Twelfth Amendment. The Twelfth Amendment allows there to be presidential and vice presidential slates. In other words, presidents run with vice presidents. And so the way this ends up uh, functioning in practice is, is that each electoral college member gets two votes. One vote dedicated for president and one vote dedicated to vice president, such that you can't have that tie issue happening anymore. Now, just for uh, a point in fact, just so you know, if vice presidents tie, and this hasn't changed, it heads to the Senate. Because remember, we said in our Congress section that vice presidents chair the Senate. Okay, so now we have kind of an understanding of the president, a little bit of the trajectory of the president, and of how we the Electoral College works. So we're going to pause our mini lecture here and pick up next time, taking a look in more depth at the power of the presidency.